Hi, I'm Illinois State Treasurer Michael Ferrix, and thank you for joining me today for our second Finwell Fireside Livestream. The Illinois Financial Wellness Hub, or Finwell Hub as we like to say, provides resources to help all Illinois residents plan a better financial future. We've dropped a link to the Finwell Hub in the chat and encourage you to sign up for an account. We'll reference helpful tools on the platform throughout the program today. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items. Throughout the webinar, we will share helpful links in the chat, so feel free to check there. The format for our audience questions will be different today, as we are joined by three special guests. I'll talk to each about their area of expertise, and then we'll have five minutes of audience questions for each guest. You can submit questions for each guest at any time throughout this segment, and we'll answer as many as we can during their five minutes of audience questions. So please use the Q&A section to submit questions. Click on the three dots in the upper right-hand corner of the screen and select Q&A. Closed captioning is available in English. Click on the CC icon in the left-hand corner to get that. This is being recorded and will be available in the webinar section of the Finwell Hub. Now we're ready to get started. Today we'll be discussing the building blocks for financial security in retirement. This is most commonly referred to as the three-legged stool of retirement, which includes workplace retirement plans, Social Security, and personal savings and investments. If one leg is missing, then the stool falls over. The stool can be unstable or not properly supported if one leg is shorter than the rest. So with the three-legged stool analogy in mind, <coughs> each of our guests will share their expertise in one area. Our first guest of the day will be discussing workplace retirement plans. Christine Cheng serves as Director of Secure Choice for my office. In her role, she oversees implementation and expansion of Illinois Secure Choice to improve retirement savings access for private sector workers, helping to ensure that more Illinoisans can have a retirement with dignity. Prior to joining the Illinois State Treasurer's Office, Christine spent 17 years working on improving financial health and benefits across access for Illinoisans. She worked on Illinois' largest free tax preparation program and a statewide coalition to help Illinoisans access their stimulus checks and the expanded child tax credit. Christine has a BA in Cognitive Science from Northwestern University. And Christine, welcome. Good to be here, Treasurer. So, Christine, let's start off. Can you tell us about defined benefit and defined contribution plans in the workplace? Absolutely. So if we go back a couple of generations, really the dominant model for workplace retirement was defined benefits. So think about a pension. And this would be, again, kind of a longer uh, ago than today you had this situation where really the employer was taking on the responsibility for the investing and the planning. At, you'd reach the end of your working career, you'd be able to draw down that pension either as monthly payments or in one lump sum, but really the responsibility was resting with the employer. Fast forward to today and then over the last several decades and you've seen a market shift, particularly in the private sector, to define contribution plans. So think of the most common types being 401k or 403b. The onus is really on the employee to decide how much they're going to save and what type of investment option they want to use. They're really responsible for, for, for accumulating those funds. So you know what I would say, of course, is that certainly if you have a workplace retirement option available to you, think about how you can use that. In addition, a lot of employers are offering matching contributions or profit sharing. They're able to add to what you can put in yourself. And so you certainly want to avail yourself of that if that's something that's in the budget for you to really start to build that nest egg. And you know, we know there are a lot of younger workers out there who might think retirement is decades away for me, but it's so important to start that habit if you can, if you know, your financial means are, are sufficient that you can put something away for the future because the compound interest will really help to build that nest egg as you start to get closer and closer to that retirement point. I find in government we talk a lot in acronyms, <coughs> numbers, 401k, I think most people know what that means, a 403b, can you tell the, the differences? I don't want someone out there thinking, well, why am I not saving a 403b? Right, so my general understanding is a 403b is, is very similar to 401k, but it's more so uh, if you're in public education, university setting, a nonprofit perhaps would have a 403b versus a 401k, but they're similar styles. You're looking, generally speaking, at putting a money, a money away, tax deferred, um, yeah. to help build over time. And if you're a state employee, a 457 account? Right, a deferred compensation type setup, yes, absolutely. Great. So what if you work for an employer that doesn't offer retirement benefits? What options do workers have in that scenario? 
Sure. So there's always the option for an individual worker to decide to go out and, and get their own, for instance, individual retirement account or set something out, uh, set, set something up that's outside of their workplace. But the reality is we don't see that very often. You know, where we see a lot of power is through uh, workplace retirement. So I know we have somebody from AARP mm -hmm. speaking later, but AARP has found that workers are 15 times more likely to save for retirement if they can do so at work through payroll deduction. So there's a lot of power to be harnessed through payroll deduction and having that workplace retirement program in place. So uh, one thing that's been a really critical policy innovation over the last several years is states really taking it upon themselves to say we have to address this looming retirement crisis wherein too many people have too little save for retirement. And so there are several states, Illinois among is, them, Illinois, is Illinois one of them. among okay. them, who have put out legislation that, that says that certain employers in the private sector need to either sponsor their own qualified retirement plan or facilitate a state-administered retirement program for private sector workers. In our state, that program would be Illinois Secure Choice. Now I'm gonna question, ask you a question I know the answer to, but uh, maybe not all our viewers do. What is Illinois Secure Choice and how does it work? Absolutely, so Illinois Secure Choice is a retirement savings program for private sector workers, and what it allows a worker to do is put away part of their paycheck through payroll deduction to put into an individual retirement account or an IRA. So um, again, harnessing the power of payroll deduction, um, it's meant to give access to private sector workers who traditionally haven't had access. We have a lot of industries where you don't tend to see workplace retirement, restaurants, hair salons, there are a lot of different industries where you don't really traditionally see that. And so the, the state law has really opened up a channel for workers who, just generally speaking, haven't been uh, able to take advantage of workplace retirement savings. So uh, the program is administered by the state. There's a seven person board, of which you are the yes. chair. Uh, but it's also, we work with a private sector financial services partner who helps to administer the program. And then all of the investments are managed by professional investment managers. So uh, everyone knows they need to save for retirement, but too many Americans put it off and they aren't able to do that. Uh, Secure Choice offers a workplace deduction, which should make it easier, but there's still a lot of Americans who feel cash strapped and mm -hmm. feel, I know I need to save, but man, I just don't have disposable income. What advice do you give for those people? Right, so I think you know individually, you have to really look at your situation and money coming in and what commitments you have going out. We know a lot of people are, are have debt that they need to pay off and, and sometimes the, the cash they have isn't enough to meet their immediate needs. So we always say, of course, put those immediate needs first. But even if you have a little bit extra that you can put aside, that helps. Setting up that habit, that practice of regularly putting something aside, it's kind of that whole pay yourself first kind of maxim that we hear a lot, um, is, is putting, that, putting that away and understanding that compound interest can help you over time to grow that. And as your means change or as your situation changes, maybe you, already, you have a little bit more access to put away for the future. You've already established that habit of putting something aside for your future. And I do think it's thinking about you know, your 65-year-old self looking back saying, I appreciate my, the younger version of myself thinking about where I would be at this point. Um, so even if it's not a lot, I think it's important to put it away if you can. Right. And it will grow over time. And uh, I find one of the most powerful forces in the universe is inertia. A body in motion tends to stay in motion. A body at rest tends to stay at rest. Do what you can to get that ball moving. Mm -hmm. When you start seeing your account grow, I think it's easier to find additional money and put it in there. Uh, we know it's not easy for everyone. But this is not, Secure Choice is not a 401k, correct? That's correct. This is just a pay, it's an individual retirement account that's funded through payroll deduction. An individual retirement account. We talked about those acronyms out there. We're talking about IRAs. Mm -hmm. We have a question from the audience. What's the difference between a Roth IRA and a traditional IRA? So with a Roth IRA, the tax, uh, I'm sorry, the dollars that are coming in are post-tax, so after tax, meaning you've already paid the tax on it and then you're putting that money away into your individual retirement account. A traditional IRA would accept pre-tax dollars, so you'll pay tax on it when it's distributed, when you start to take it out later on, versus with a Roth, it's always post-tax dollars. So we're not, you're not a financial advisor, correct? Mm -hmm. But in general, are there some people who would be better served by a traditional IRA and mm -hmm. some people who would be better served by putting into a Roth IRA? Well, there are income limits regarding who can use a Roth IRA. So if you were above that income limit, then traditional would be the route to go because you can't use a Roth. So I think that's important. And I think one key thing too is within Illinois Secure Choice, the default setting is for this money to be put into a Roth IRA. And what that enables is withdrawal of contributions without a tax penalty because these are post-tax dollars, you've already paid tax. We certainly understand that some of the participants in our program have financial shocks that they experience or immediate needs. They may need to withdraw those contributions. They're able to do that without tax penalty. Okay. Uh, what's the difference between a defer deferred compensation and a pension? 
especially a lot of our state employees, we talk about our 547s, but they also have a pension. Mm -hmm. uh, for people who just are, want to learn more about retirement, what's the difference? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know that I'm 100% qualified to say authoritatively all the differences there, but the pension is something that you just do not see very often any longer. Um, deferred compensation is something that I think is more popular. I would say definitely check on the internet because I'm really probably not the right person to, to give all the details between yeah. the differences between the two. I think your pension has a guaranteed benefit, right. so a guaranteed payment coming out, your deferred contribution. Uh, you have out what you're able to put in plus the growth uh, in investments or so. So right. uh, the pension um, doesn't have quite as much upside, but it's got much more security. Right. Um, I think that's probably a big difference. So someone is asking a general rule about what percentage you should save each year. That's a now, great Now this point. is, I, I think I have an idea of the answer here too. It sort of depends who you talk to. It but, uh, right. I think it does depend. I mean, we've heard things about 10 or 15 percent. I think that if that if you can hit that, that's great. If you can do more, obviously, that's great, too. But let's not discourage folks who can't get to that point to say, well, if I can't do 10 percent, let's say, or 12 percent, maybe it's not even worth doing it. I would say if you can put something away, put it away. Don't be discouraged by how much you're putting away and feeling like you're not hitting that minimum. Anything that you put away is important for that that future version of yourself. Yeah. Um, so let's be a little more general here. Why is it important to save for retirement? You know, because people, I, I love my job. I don't intend to retire anytime soon. Right, well, so I think we will all reach a point at which work, the work that we do today, maybe in our younger years, will not be exactly what we would be ready to do or continue to do later on in our more golden years. And you have to think about, you have to, you're gonna be living for X number of years and we know expected life expectancy is increasing, generally speaking. How are you going to fund those years when you're not having this income stream that you've had for your working career, 35, 40 years? And so people will, and I know we're going to talk about Social Security later, it's not going to be enough. Social Security wasn't ever meant to be the sole source of income in retirement. So You anticipated the next question. <laughs> uh, so, so Social Security, as someone asked, uh, isn't that what's supposed to fund my retirement? Um, I, it, Right, and per kind of the three-legged stool thought of this, it's one component of how you can fund your retirement, but it's not meant to be the sole source of income. And unfortunately, we have a higher and higher percentage of Illinoisans who are really relying on Social Security as their primary source when that's not going to be sufficient, and that leaves them in a, in a bad spot. All right. Um, so uh, well, thank you for coming here today. Any wrap-up of the kind of uh, uh, things we haven't touched on yet today? Uh, I think we covered a lot of it, but again, I would say just to recap, if you have access to a workplace retirement program and you have the means to contribute, really think about how you can use that to really grow your retirement security. Look at those possible employer matches or non-elective non deferrals or profit sharing. Really look to maximize what you have there. Um, if you're somebody who doesn't have that option at work, um, be aware that you can go out and open your own individual retirement account. If you would like to self-enroll in Illinois Secure Choice, that's also an option. And remember that compound interest is can help you grow even what you don't think maybe is a lot. Over time, it can help to increase that. Great. Well, Christine, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions for Christine. We do have a couple more uh, guests joining us. Christine, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. All right, our next special guest will discuss Social Security retirement benefits. Philippe Largent is the state director of AARP Illinois, the Illinois chapter of the nation's largest nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering Americans 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. For more than 25 years, Philippe has leveraged his knowledge of government, the legislative and regulatory process, and his extensive network of business relationships inside and outside of government to help Illinois organizations achieve their strategic objectives. Philippe began his career as a budget and policy analyst for the Illinois House of Representatives from 1991 to 1997. He provided counsel to the Speaker's Office and members of the Illinois General Assembly on a variety of issues. From 1997 to 2010, Philippe served as Director of Legislative Affairs and then Vice President for Government Affairs for the Illinois Primary Healthcare Association a statewide trade association representing the network of community health centers 
providing health care services to low-income, uninsured Illinois residents. In 2010, Philippe founded Largent Government Solutions LLC, an Illinois-based lobbying and consulting firm specializing in health care. Philippe is a graduate of Middlebury College with a degree in political science and concentration in Russian literature. Philippe, welcome. The full bio this, you know, <laughs> Treasurer Ferrix, it's great to be here. Thank you. Great. Please, thanks for coming, <laughs> coming out today. So if we, let's just start off here. You're talking about Social Security. Who is eligible for Social Security benefits? Well, if you are uh, 62 or older and you've got at least 10 years or more working and paying into Social Security, you are eligible uh, to start receiving benefits. Right, so you're eligible at 62. Right. Do you recommend people start collecting or drawing a 62? Well, look, it depends, right? If um, your financial situation requires that you t start to tap into those benefits and you need to start doing that at 62, uh, by all means, uh, you're, eligible to part you're eligible to participate and, and start receiving benefits. However, and this is a big however, the benefit will be, could be up to 30% less than uh, what you would receive had you uh, waited until your full retirement age, which is generally 66 or 67. Okay. So um, I'm a young man who's a long way away from retirement. <laughs> right. Um, can you explain to me how benefits are calculated? Sure. Benefits are calculated based on the uh, top 35 years of, of earnings. Uh, if you don't have 35 years of earnings, those years that you're missing are calculated as zero and that's how your benefit is, is calculated. There are tremendous uh, tools out on the, uh, uh, on the internet, uh, aarp.org, uh, um, um, aarp.illinois.org, uh, and, um, and the Social Security Administration have excellent tools to help you calculate uh, generally, approximately, what your benefit will be. So that's a good resource to go to. Um, so you said you could start, you could start collecting at 62, the maximum age is 67. At 67, do you have to start collecting? You do not have to start collecting at 67. You can defer uh, collecting your benefit up to 70. And if you do that, uh, you could receive um, uh, a higher benefit. So I think we've got a, a diagram on the screen. And so the first person there uh, uh, is thinking about starting to receive their benefit uh, at age 62. Uh, maybe they need to, maybe they don't, but if they need to, it, it's there for them. But if they can wait a little longer to that 67, 66 age, they can receive 100% of their benefit. If they wait even a little longer, 68, 69, 70, they can receive up to 130% uh, uh, of their benefit. All right, so that graph shows the up to 30% reduction in your monthly benefit. Is it on a sliding scale between 62 and 66? Let's say I don't want to take it at 62, but at 65, I lose my job. Am I going to have a 30% reduction um, if I take it before my 66th birthday? You could see uh, a reduction. Uh, how much, I think, is really dependent on your situation and the numbers that uh, the Social Security Administration calculates for you. Okay, so it's a really specific answer for each individual, but the longer you can delay, the longer you, don't you can need it, delay, the greater the, the percentage you're going to get going forward. Correct. However, lots of folks um, have to tap into their benefit, and I get it. Um, um, to your three-legged stool, uh, hopefully the other two legs uh, are there to support their, their retirement. So um, obviously there's a big benefit to delaying in terms of how much you get paid monthly. Are there other pros and cons of delaying benefits? Well, look, the, uh, you know, certainly the increased uh, benefit um, uh, can go up 8% uh, per year up to 70, and that's a tremendous uh, uh, benefit enhancement, so to speak, if you can wait that long. Uh, you know, the, the challenge with... Um, uh, the challenge with waiting, of course, is if you pass yeah. away, unfortunately, you wouldn't get your full benefit. Um, uh, um, and you, you wouldn't be able to, um, you know, cover your benefit, you wouldn't be able to cover your expenses that you're experiencing now. Yeah. So yeah. We, all know, we all know we're not going to live forever. Right. Uh, but we don't expect to pass away tomorrow, and we don't hope to pass away anytime soon. So if I'm trying to make a calculus here, is there a general rule of a break-even 
you think like if you can if you can live to if you only live to 71 it probably doesn't make financial sense to defer until age 70 but if you live to age 95 I'm gonna guess that you will come out financially ahead if you wait until age 70 if you can if you can right so um, at AARP we you know we know that our members are are you know we've got members who are on all ends of the financial security spectrum um, it's not surprising at all to find people who are in their mid 60s or early 70s who feel like I've got to tap into my benefits now and I, yeah. I simply cannot wait um, on you know the average benefit in Illinois is about fifteen hundred dollars probably not covering um, as much as we would have hoped for of your of your daily living expenses like yeah. mortgage or rent food prescription drugs and that is fifteen hundred dollars per month per month right so um, is there a maximum if it's the average of fifteen hundred good question I don't know if there's a okay. I don't know if there's a maximum monthly benefit now we also realize the world doesn't revolve just around us we have families how do spouse and survival benefits work spousal benefits uh, are worth about 50 percent of your uh, spouse's total benefits so for example if your spouse is uh, generating uh, earn more benefit uh, or has you know a significantly higher benefit than you it may be advantageous to um, tap into the spousal benefit because you'll get a, a higher benefit um, um, there are rules around, you know, the, how old you are and, and, and when you tap in and when your spouse starts to collect benefits. So those all impact uh, the amount of benefit that you'll collect. Okay. So sounds complex, but we have tools that you can go through AARP's website we or Social AARP, Security's website. AARP's website, the Social Security Administration. I think if I had one takeaway about Social Security is at, take the time to educate yourself. You've been paying into the system for many, many years if, you, if you've been paying into Social Security. Uh, not everyone pays in, into Social Security, but most people do, many people do, and you've been paying in for a long time. Make sure you understand what your benefit is. Make sure you understand how to access the benefit. And really today we've talked about when to access that benefit. When, is it, when does it make sense for you to access it? Yeah, so we talked about people paying in over years, and they think, finally, I'm right. done paying taxes here. I'm just going to collect money. But some people might be surprised that their Social Security, Social Security might be taxed. How is Social Security taxed? Well, first, the good news. Uh, in Illinois, uh, state government does not tax uh, Social Security benefits, and that is, uh, that is fantastic news. Uh, at the federal level, um, Social Security is taxed just like regular income. So depending on... Uh, how much uh, benefit you uh, collect, uh, that benefit um, is, is taxed at, at certain levels. And I think we've got something on the screen that shows you how, you know, where, when that kicks in. Great. Well, while the audience is reading that, uh, we have an audience question that came sure. in. Sure. Someone asked, if half of my husband's Social Security money is more than what I would receive, am I going to receive the higher amount? I believe the answer is yes. Do not make a decision based on the answer that I just gave. <laughs> like I said, please educate yourself and get, uh, get um, information from the Social Security Administration or you can go to AARP.org and get that and, and, find, um, uh, and find our section on Social Security um, um, to educate yourself about that question. But I believe the answer is yes. So um, we go check out information, make sure it's true, but also be aware that legislation can get passed at any time and can change any information we're telling you. So in the past, um, 67 was not the highest uh, mm. level for retirement uh, that was changed. One of our audience members asked if they changed the retirement age again, uh, would anyone be grandfathered in for the current retirement age of 67? So someone who currently does mm. is expected to retire at 67 uh, and maybe they've got a few years till they get there. Um, I will say that social, you know, the future of Social Security and the, um, the, the, the variety, various proposals on how to extend the longevity of the program, um, all of those issues are so complex, uh, it's really hard to speculate as to what would happen. Um, um, 
And at AARP, of course, we try to keep our members and non-members who, uh, who haven't joined yet um, uh, as educated as we can on what the current state of play in the program is, what the future might hold, uh, and educating people just on the basics of what the program is. Again, most people have been paying into the system for years and years and years. It's their money. Um, yeah. Uh, and I want it to be there when it's when you're ready to uh, collect your benefit. Okay, so you said most people have been paying in for years and yeah. years. I think people expect that when I retire, I'll get a Social Security check. I know I've talked to people who are surprised that they either don't qualify or as much smaller than they thought. Mm. People who weren't in the workforce or some of the people in state government or maybe you're in uh, teachers or something. Right. Can you explain to those who might be surprised uh, at the lack of Social Security benefits? Well, um, you know, and, and, this, and this, goes back, this goes back to education, so I feel like a, a somewhat of a broken record. That, that's okay. This is a I'm, Fidwell financial <laughs> right, literacy hub. Right, right. Our job is to educate people right. here today. Uh, understanding uh, your current workplace uh, 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 re retirement systems, understanding what that pay stub looks like every two weeks, how much is going where? Are you paying into Social Security? Are you not paying into Social Security? Are you, uh, in a, are you in a pension? Are you one of those employees that doesn't pay into Social Security and you pay into something else? Uh, having that knowledge, uh, I think, is key uh, so that there aren't any surprises. There's no heartache at the end uh, when you're ready to uh, initiate benefits. I run into a lot of teachers here mm -hmm. in Illinois who have a pension and uh, they get ready to retire, and some of them told me, uh, why don't I qualify for benefits? Do you know why? Social I, Security benefits. I don't know okay. why explicitly. No. Well, I think, I think they're saying is when, when Illinois set up the teacher retirement system. Okay. This was a time that uh, they were given a choice. You could either uh, pay for uh, Social Security benefits, so was that 6.5% or so of salary, okay. uh, or you can offer a pension. If you offer a pension that meets a certain standard, the state only didn't have to pay into the Social Security system. Oh. And so those employees uh, are disappointed to find out they don't collect in addition oh. a Social Security check. And so their, their three-legged stool might actually only have two legs. Two legs. legs. To, to it. Well, then I, I hope that third, I hope the two legs that are still there are robust. And of course, um, there are other uh, retirement tools available to people uh, outside of the workplace that they can save money for. Now, I you know I know that that's a challenge for someone or for some people, and and I and I, I certainly get that. But um, this is why this program is so great. Discussing these issues now, not at the end. Discussing them uh, when in, you're in your 20s and 30s at ARP. We are partnering with Illinois State University, we're talking to college kids about Social Security and what it means to save for retirement. Talking about Secure Choice, a uh, program that I, that I very much admire. Um, um, educated, having that discussion now so that you are an educated retirement saver. Um, um, so there are no surprises, so you know exactly where um, that, where, you know, how much is coming out of your paycheck, where it's going, where it ends up at the end, and when you can start collecting it. And then, of course, you know, when should I take the benefit? When should I not take the benefit? Can I afford to wait? Um, there are a lot of questions. And so, it, so it's worth your time. It's worth your time to, get, to educate yourself. It's worth your time to have these conversations. Very much so. We appreciate yeah. AARP being part of Secure Choice, helping to pass it, being great allies. We look to expand it and help more people. Uh, really appreciate that. So my last question yeah. for you is a question in your role at AARP. Um, sometimes there are young people like, like myself who okay. get uh, letters from AARP. What, what is wrong with your system that you're sending information to such <laughs> young people? Well, you know, um, <laughs> well, look, uh, we, you know, at AARP, first of all, there is no age limit to join. You can join whenever you would like to join. Sh shameless plug for joining AARP. But uh, 
the reality is, is that so many of the issues that are affecting 50 plus really affect 50 plus and their families. Yeah. Whether it's retirement savings, um, um, uh, uh, you know, college savings, we're working on a bill uh, now uh, where the 50 plus are impacted and it's, it's essentially a, 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 you know, a college uh, savings uh, program, but the 50 plus are really impacted because a lot of 50 plus co-sign for loans. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it's, a, it's a big deal for that constituency. Um, um, uh, we do a lot of work around financial literacy, pocketbook issues. Uh, all of those, so many of those issues are relevant to young folks like yourself. Thank you. Uh, they're relevant to the 50 plus uh, and everybody in between. Great. So um, I know ARP does a great job lobbying on behalf of retired people or people preparing for retirement. Uh, also a lot of great benefits. I was not aware you could sign to be a member of ARP uh, before age 50. So let's say if someone is 30 years old and they decide to join ARP, do they get those same member discounts? I believe they do, yes. Yes, absolutely. Great. And so for people wanting to learn more about AARP, where can they find that information? AARP.org. AARP.org backslash Illinois. Uh, you will get to our blog page. You will see all of the offerings that AARP Illinois offers. Uh, the AARP.org website is a really comprehensive I mean, anything that's impacting the 50 plus, I am almost certain you can find some information, whether it be caregiving, uh, retirement, Social Security, Medicare, um, uh, cooking classes, gardening advice. It's spring, people are getting into their gardens, uh, book clubs, movies for grownups, another great uh, fun activity that we offer in Illinois where we, we we buy the tickets uh, for people to come and see first run films. Um, it's a great time to get out of the house, see a movie, uh, enjoy um, seeing a movie with other people in your age cohort. We've got a lot going on. I'm really busy, Mike. I've got to, I've got to go. I've got stuff to do. <laughs> as, as, as the pandemic is uh, officially sort of ending today, that's a great uh, bit of advice here. People to get back in the movie theaters, people have been avoiding them for a while. Go out with people in your cohort. Uh, and thank, Philippe, thanks for talking today about saving for retirement and Social Security because I think we can save now or we can pay later. Right. Uh, those are our choices. Educate yourself and thank you, Healthcare Heroes, for getting us through the pandemic. Great. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions for Philippe. Uh, so, Philippe, thanks for joining us today. If you still have questions about Social Security and retirement, you should join us in June for a deep dive conversation with the Social Security Administration. You can register for that online. Great. Philippe, thanks very much. Thank you. Our last guest today will share how personal investments factor into financially secure retirement. Joe Aguilar is the Chief Investment Officer for my office. In his role, Joe directs seven investment portfolios spanning across public and private market investments on behalf of Illinois Treasury's combined $58 billion investment portfolio. He leads all aspects of investment implementation, including leading the investment team and the stewardship for all investments in external public and private market investment managers. Joe was previously the Director of Investment Analysis and Due Diligence with the Illinois State Treasury and led due diligence efforts. Prior to joining the Illinois Treasury, he worked for Fortaleza Asset Management. Joe holds a BS with a double major in finance and business and commerce from Aurora University and an MS in finance from the University of Miami's Herbert Business School. He also serves as a board member for the Council of Institutional Investors chair of the investment committee for the Field Foundation of Illinois, and is an adjunct professor, professor at Aurora University. Joe, welcome, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Treasurer, good afternoon, and appreciate you having me. So we've talked a lot about the three-legged stool out there. Let's get to that third leg. What role do investments play in retirement savings? When we think about investment and retirement savings in general, really the end goal is to ensure that an individual has a comfortable standard of living and that the individual has that freedom and control of their lifestyle well down the road, especially as it relates to past that earnings types of years. So when we think about investments and the role that they play, what they do is that they help accumulate wealth and grow assets. 
One of the ways that that happens with investments is through this magical phenomenon called compound interest. Now, what exactly is compound interest? That is earning a return or interest on top of interest that you've already earned. So an example of that would be if I put in $100 into an account, I made 5%, I now have $105 after that first year. In the second year, if I make another 5%, I now have $110.25. So it is earning money on top of money. That may seem very small to begin with, but over time, that number grows dramatically. And the role that investments plays in this whole retirement aspect is trying to accelerate that accumulation of wealth. Yeah, uh, I heard an interview with Warren Buffett and uh, what, how he got so wealthy. And he talks about things like this. You make, you make investments, they grow over time, and they compound, and someone said, well, that sounds very easy, Mr. Buffett. Why doesn't everyone do this? And do you remember what his answer was? I do not. What was his answer? He said, because no one wants to get rich slowly. <laughs> they all, everyone wants to get rich quick, uh, but these are the, fact for the, the best paths for most people out there. To invest, to put your money aside, and let time be your friend. So I find in this area of investments, everyone knows they need to save, but if they go and talk to a financial advisor, there are lots of terms thrown out there to them that they may not be familiar with. And part of the problem for saving is, I've talked to people who said, um, the, uh, my investment manager asked if I wanted large cap, domestic, international, small cap, and these things were just a foreign language to me, and I walked out without making any decisions. So let's start with some real basics here. People hear about stocks and bonds all the time in the news. Um, what is their purpose in a portfolio? It's a great question. And yes, there is a slew of research, a slew of investment options that are out there. But if we start with more of the basics, what exactly is a stock? And just starting there, a stock is a fractional ownership into a company. Stocks are usually traded on a exchange. We read about it in the news all the time in terms of the stock price going up stock price going down. An example of this is I own a share of Apple or I own a share of Amazon. Well-known companies and if you own that share, technically you are an owner of the company itself. So that's what a stock is. A bond is certainly different. A bond represents a loan from an issuer to an investor or to an individual. The best way to break this down, think of an IOU. Somebody gives money, they owe you money back. And these are issued by governments, and they're issued by corporations, and they have that set standard interest rate that they're paying to you as an investor. So when we think about stocks and bonds, those are what they really come down to. Now, each of those have very unique characteristics, especially when it comes to risk of investing in a stock, risk of investing in a bond. Typically, on average, stocks are riskier than bonds. And an investor, when they think about risk in general, what they have to think about is, if you are taking higher risk, you should expect to have a higher return because you need to be compensated for that risk. So investments in stocks, you should expect a higher return than an investment in a bond, which is less risky. And when we think about the basics of those two securities, that's what it comes down to. The purpose of these being in a portfolio is what we talked about earlier, accelerating that wealth generation and growing money, growing an investment. Now, I don't want to scare anyone from investing, but I know people have said, well, I'm investing in bonds because I don't like risk. Is there any risk involved with bonds? There are always risks involved yes. in any investment, whether it be a stock, whether it be a bond. There are risks. There's disclosures that outline each of those material risks involved. So while bonds may be less risky than a stock, there certainly still are risks. Yeah, I've heard people just were shocked when they found their bond could in fact lose money, but your chances are less. So let's back up. I talked about a portfolio of securities. There are a variety of investment options to choose from in a portfolio. So uh, what is a portfolio of securities? It's a great question. So we talked about stocks, we talked about bonds. When you put those two assets together, and we can even throw in cash, it creates something called an investment portfolio. And what the goal is with an investment portfolio is to build one that's known as diversified. You typically hear the term 
a diversified portfolio. The simplest way to break this down is that you're not putting all your eggs in one basket yeah. or all your eggs in stocks and saying, yes, this is the best way to do this. While that may work for somebody, it may not work for somebody else. So a diversified portfolio has stocks in it, it has bonds in it, it has cash in it as well. And really the goal there is to ensure that you are building something that is able to withstand down markets like we saw last year, but then also is able to take advantage when markets go up. So it's also trying to reduce some of those stomach churning things that happen in the market, like a down market in general. And when we think about a stock in the role of an investment portfolio, that's the more aggressive part of the portfolio because it's more risky. So you expect a higher return. On the bond side, sorry, on the bond side, you're getting interest income from that debt type of vehicle. And it's less risky, but it still serves a purpose. So we hear diversification is important. So that could be cash, it could be bonds, it could be stocks. But even within stocks, would you recommend someone pick a sector they think is going to perform really well and put it all into a tech sector or utilities or minerals? Any advice there? Yeah. Every investor is different. And diversification is really the key to spread out risk in a portfolio. So investing just in one sector, you subject yourself to a lot of risk versus being invested across healthcare, technology, industrials, consumer stable type companies where the risk is then mitigated and spread out across different sectors. Okay, so let's say there's someone who has bought your line, uh, the line I share as well, that you need to be diversified, but they say, I just, I don't have much experience with investing, I don't know what all this means. Is there an easy way to diversify? The simplest way to think about this and agree that not everybody's going to have the same type of vacuum. And it's going to really vary for every individual in terms of what they should be investing in and what their comfort level is more specifically around these types of investments. And investors, what they should do always, first and foremost, is assess what their level of risk is. How willing are they to stomach a reduction in their portfolio value of 20%, maybe that's too much. They say, hey, that's a lot of risk. I don't want to take that type of risk. Well, then maybe you're a little bit more of a moderate risk or a conservative risk type person, where if the portfolio falls five or 10%, say, hey, I'm okay with that. There's different options then to select to align to your level of risk. One of the other pieces that is very important in this equation is not just the risk side, but also your time horizon. Yeah. How long do you have to save? Is it 40 years? Is it for a young individual like yourself an expanded <laughs> time? Or is it a very short time where I'm gonna retire in the next two to three years? If it is someone who is gonna retire in a very, rec in a very near future, what you are gonna to wanna to see is less risk in that portfolio, less of an ability for that portfolio to really draw down and lose value versus somebody who is just starting to save at, let's say, the age of 21 years old, they have 40 plus years until they retire. So they can withstand a portfolio going down further than somebody who might be 62, 63 years old. So someone would ask, is there an investment option that's the right choice for them? It sounds to me like it really sort of depends on your own tolerances and your age and anticipated time of retirement. Absolutely. And once you have that established, you will be in a much better place to select the investment option that fits your needs as your age really dictates, but then also as a risk tolerance dictates. Great. Let's go to a few audience questions. In the three-legged stool, is it assumed each leg of the stool is proportional to the others, or the sum of the totals is the level you need to live on? I think it's a fantastic question. I think across all the areas that we're covered today, they are all equally important. They all serve different roles in general. And what happens is, you know, from the investment side, it's going to then aid the other legs of this stool. Um, you know, I think a lot of people are hopefully looking at this today, inspired by some of the things you're saying, start asking questions. Do you have any recommendations for people who want to continue to learn, any authors or books uh, on how to improve finance for retirement? There are so many resources out there, from basics of what are stocks, what are bonds, to very sophisticated topics. You mentioned Warren Buffett being one of the most well-known investors. There's books out there that talk about how he has invested, 
how he's done well, but there's also a significant amount of academic research around, whether it be stocks, whether it be bonds. The idea for individuals to educate themselves and learn more about investments is one that if you're saving for retirement, you certainly should be looking at. Yeah, well, lots of resources out there for someone who wants to do this, but let's go back to this. Let's say I don't have time for this, I'm busy, I just want to set it and forget it approach. You know, I don't want to come back and revisit this every quarter or look at every month. Are there avenues or things I can explore to just put my money in and someone else will take care of this diversification and this uh, and the differences in my age? Absolutely. So every investor is different, as we've talked about. If somebody's looking for an option where they can just set it and forget it, say, hey, I just want to put money away every month and I don't want to think about do I have to weight a portfolio different? Do I need more stocks? Do I need more bonds? I don't want to make that active choice. There are options out there. They're known as target date funds, which are out there which professional investment managers are making those decisions and are leveling off the risk as somebody gets older. So that type of stock exposure is higher for people who are younger. And then in a target date fund, as that person matures and they get closer to that retirement date, the level of stocks goes down and is replaced with cash as well as bonds to lower the risk. Great. Well, hey, I want to thank you for taking the time here today. There's a lot to learn and hopefully a lot of people out there are um, interested in learning more and preparing for a bright uh, future. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions. Joe, thanks for joining us here today and thank you all for joining this conversation. We hope this conversation encourages you to start or to continue planning for the future. The Finwell Hub is a great resource and has a retirement analyzer that can help you assess whether you're on track for retirement or need to make some adjustments to reach your goals. As always, the link is in the chat. Now save the date for our final live stream this season. On Thursday, June 8th, we'll be joined by the Social Security Administration as we demystify Social Security. But before you leave, please take a minute to complete a short survey provide feedback about today's webinar and suggest topics for future programs. The survey link, as always, is in the chat. Thank you so much for joining us today and thank you to Christine, Philippe, and Joe for speaking with us and sharing your expertise. We hope you heard some helpful tips today and will join us next time. Have a great day.